My name is Katie Lane. Uh, I am an attorney and a negotiation coach. I work primarily with freelancers and artists. Uh, I help them protect their stuff and get paid. I think both of those things are pretty neat when you are an artist or a freelancer. Um, I uh, run a, my, no, uh, my remote's not working. Um, so I run a blog called Work Made for Hire uh, that uh, I write negotiation advice about once a week, and then I am on Twitter far too much. So if you ever want nuggets of freelance wisdom delivered to your Twitter feed, that is, that is where you can find me. That's fine. Um, so uh, I told a couple people I was doing this talk, and they said, that sounds great. What the hell is Leaning In? Leaning In, in case you do not know, is a book that uh, Cheryl, Sh Cheryl Sandberg released, um, basically talking about how women could advance in the corporate workplace. And the media loved it. They thought it was the best thing ever. It was providing this wonderful solution to why women don't have power in the workforce, and it was because they just weren't leaning in. Turns out, all they had to do was ask, and everything was gonna be so much better. Uh, and everybody thought, it, you know, they liked the hell out of it. Uh, the media kind of went crazy. They, um, they wrote about how this was the answer. This was the solution. All women had to do now was lean in. And this made me incredibly sad, because Lean In is a horrible negotiation book. Uh, it might be a very good book for other reasons. I don't want to take anything away from her. Nobody else had written a book recently about, uh, that got that much attention about women in the workforce, so props to her for that. But as a negotiation book, it didn't actually teach anybody anything. It just loudly stated that we should all negotiate more often and everything would be better. Uh, to me, as somebody who cares very much about negotiation uh, and spends far too much time thinking about it, it's like yelling that everything would be better if we all spoke French and then not teaching anybody French. <laughs> so it, it sounds like the beginnings of a good idea, but it doesn't actually lead through. So today I wanted to take some time and uh, go through three things about negotiation that I think would be helpful. Uh, the first is I'm going to talk about how to ask for what it is that you want. Then we're going to talk about taking control within a negotiation if you feel like you are in a less than desirable position. And then finally we're going to talk about how to be awesome. Because uh, negotiating is in large part about feeling confident, feeling good about yourself. It is hard to feel confident when you don't know what you are doing. So we are going to talk about how to know what you are doing, and then we're going to talk about some of the tricks that I have actually used uh, to get myself going when I need to confront a difficult situation. So first up, how to ask for what you want. Uh, spoilers, almost everybody does this incorrectly. Usually they ask for exactly what they want. I want $5,000, I want a new job, I want, uh, you know, I want a thing. And what they're doing is they're asking for a position. It is very hard to negotiate when you have a position because it is a an immovable object. It is just a thing, no more than that. It is much easier to negotiate when you understand why somebody wants what they want. So it is much easier to negotiate when you understand somebody's interests. So a position can be a thing, it's a, an amount of money, it is your ability, say, to work remotely, it is uh, negotiating uh, with somebody about where you're going to eat dinner that night. The position is what you want. Your interests are why you want what you want. If you can explain to somebody that the reason that you want something is because it will make your life easier, you will be more productive, this is the going value for a job uh, of this stature, they are more inclined to listen to you, and if they can't provide exactly what it is that you have asked for, they can at least work with you to come up with other options. So to, to show you how this might work, uh, let's pretend that my wife and I decide we need more animals in the house. And I have decided that the best way to fulfill this, this need is uh, by getting a French bulldog. So I want a French bulldog. Totally true statement, but it's a position. If my wife does not want a French bulldog, I have now reduced the negotiation to a yes or no situation. I have a 50-50 chance of getting what it is I actually want. But if I describe my interest in why I want a French Bulldog, I will start describing the qualities of the pet that I'm looking for. So I might tell her I want a pet that is affectionate, 
and silly, friendly, loyal. Uh, French bulldogs are not loyal, by the way. They will love anybody. I want something, I want something that's weird and cute and talkative and soft and cuddly and goofy. I have now given her a ton more information to work with. Instead of just saying, I want this thing, yes or no, I am saying, I want something that looks like this, which prompts, prompts the conversation to be more of a problem-solving conversation than it is purely a, a, a yes or no situation. So if I only use my positions, I either get this dog or I don't get this dog. Don't worry, I have the dog. Um, <laughs> but that's it. Those are my only options. My happiness is based on whether or not I hear yes. But if I use my interests, I might get this dog, or I might get that dog, or that dog, or that one, or a duck, <laughs> a llama, actually I think that's an alpaca, or a kitty. Who knew? Maybe what I really wanted was a kitty. But I, because I was so set on the position, I wouldn't have been able to see that as an option. By describing to my wife what it was that I was actually interested in, we are able to together come up with a couple of different options, and one of these might actually serve my interests better than what it was I said I wanted. Not, that's not definite, but it's possible that one of these things could, be, could fulfill my interest just as much as that French bulldog. So, that's great. You all now know how to negotiate with my wife over a French bulldog. <laughs> She's going to be thrilled. <laughs> um, but what if you want money? Because money is not a French bulldog. It is not cuddly or soft or goofy or silly. It is just money. Um, and a lot of people get tied up here because $300 is very different from $3,000. They are not interchangeable. I am not going to be happy with one if I want the other. Well, I might be happy with the $3,000 if I want $300, but. Um, so if you are talking about money, my recommendation to you is uh, to be a three-year-old. And the reason I want you to be a three-year-old is because money inherently does not have value. It is paper. It does not do anything for you unless you have something to spend it on. Those things that you want to spend money on are your interests in why you want that money. So, I might want money because I know I have a certain number of bills that I have to meet. I might not want money because I know that the going rate for the work that I do is X amount of dollars. I might want money because I am building up a safety net. And this particular job, if I'm paid at this price, will allow me to complete that savings plan. There are lots of different reasons why I might want that money, but if I just leave it as, I want $3,000, I don't, I don't know why I want that money, which means it's harder for me to negotiate over it, because I'm just negotiating over a number, I'm not negotiating over something that means something to me, and it's harder for the other person to understand why I am asking for the thing that I am asking for. So um, let's pretend that you're all freelancers, because I know freelancers, uh, and you are bidding on a job, and you are asking for a particular rate for that job. If you have a day job, we can pretend that you are applying for a job and you want a particular salary. Why might you want that salary or that rate? You would like to pay some bills. It would be very nice to be able to pay some bills. What are some, what are some other reasons you might want? Yes? Uh, my work is worth this Your work is worth that much. So it, it is about your worth and your view of yourself and how the other person is viewing you. I have fun things I like to do that cost money. I have fun things that I like to do that cost money. It's a perfectly valid reason to want to spend your, your, your money on something fun. You are bringing value to your client or customer. They are going to use your services in a way that will be valuable to them. Therefore, you should be able to share in that value. Right? There is a hand over here. Go for it. Uh, I want financial security so that I can take risks with my career. I want financial security so I can take risks with my career. I'm on a retirement timeline and I want to be done in five years. I'm on a retirement <laughs> timeline and I want to be done in five years. God bless America. <laughs> I want an increase over my previous job. And there's one more. I 
I might have done work at a certain rate for other clients and it would be unfair if I provided a significant discount to somebody that I don't even know or ha it hasn't proven themselves to be a good client to me. So I think that took us about two minutes to figure out why money had value uh, in, a, in a hypothetical situation. The next time you're in a situation where you're negotiating over money, take the time to sit down and answer those questions for yourself. Because what you'll find is by knowing your why behind what you want, it is much easier for you to stand up for yourself. Because when somebody comes back to you and does the usual game that we play when we negotiate over money where I ask for $3,000 and you say, that's too steep. I can only go $2,250. You know, $2, um, and then I go, well, that, that's ridiculous. I can only go down to $2,800. And we just go back and forth until we, are, we find this place in the middle where we're mostly unhappy, but we're willing to say yes. So instead of doing that, when somebody comes back to you and says, you know what, I can only offer you $2,250, you say, I appreciate that, but I need to explain to you that, if, that I've done work for other clients at this rate, um, so I can't provide you a discount on the first time round. And, then, and you should also understand that the work that I'm going to provide you is val can be valuable and used by your company in these ways. Can you tell me why you think that's not worth $3,000? And then they're in the position of saying, well, actually, eh, maybe it is. So by understanding the why, I know I, I keep saying this, but by understanding the why, it's much easier for you to actually stay in the negotiation and not get caught up in chopping numbers in half. Yes? I might be jumping in it, so I don't know, but as a freelancer, I feel that I'm mostly competing with the other bids. Yeah. So what I have to justify is why paying me this much is better than paying another person less than that much. So I have to figure out how to convince them that paying me more will get you more mm -hmm. paying them less. So, uh, that's a really good question. Um, it, as a freelancer, um, you're usually in the situation of having to bid against another freelancer, somebody else who is willing to do the job for less money or more quickly. But your, your bid is influenced heavily by the market. And when I talk to clients in that situation, um, I, I have them sit down and say, OK, what's good about working with you? What do I get from working with you? What are your particular skills? How do you work with clients? What are the things that you bring to the project that are either unique to you or the result of uh, skill level, experience, time? And that is the reason why you are more valuable. Because it is not merely comparing chunk of money to chunk of money. It is comparing you and your quality of work to the work that somebody else might provide. And that is a very hard one-to-one. -one. Um, sometimes when people are looking for something purely practical, they're, they're looking at exactly what they need, and they're only looking at that step. Oftentimes, the value that we bring our clients are a couple steps in. So you know that if you do the project correctly, there are going to be few, fewer mishaps later on, or it's going to be easier to update later on. Um, so looking, looking at those few steps forward and helping your clients see that can help them see that the value is not just in getting the thing from you, it is in the quality of the thing that they are going to get and the limited amount of time that they are going to have to spend on that. Um, that being said, if you are comparing yourself specifically to people with um, the exact same experience, the exact same skill level, and you are way outside of the bids, uh, it's worth it to do some investigating and see why other people are asking for what they're asking for. Um, because in the long run, if you were, if you were, if you were that outside of the market, um, it's, it's going to be more difficult. Does that answer your question-ish? Yeah, um, but you also don't know the other two. You, and your value is, the, your, it's hard to prove your value before they see you. Like, I'm saying, yeah, I'm good at it. it yeah, so the, the comment was that sometimes it can, you don't know what the other bid is and it can sort of feel like a, a mechanic saying, well, yeah, I'm good at this, trust me, it's going to be fine. I'm never going to see you again. Do you have a comment?
So the, the comment, the. And that's for Oregon. And um, there's a national website as well that you can go to and figure out what your competition is charging for government services. So what was the, what was the website in Oregon? Orpin, O-R-P-I-N, is a site where you can go and see the winning bids for government contracts. Well, it's where you bid for government contracts. Okay. In the process, you can also see your competition, how much they bid for the same work, who was the winning contract, and then you can tell me why their contract was the winning contract. So you, you can get quite a bit of information about oh, yeah. why, why somebody won a particular contract. Um, I will also put into the session notes, I have an uh, online Google Doc um, where I ask people to put in their ranges for different types of freelance work um, that's accessible to anybody. The idea being that if you really don't know what other people with your level of experience are charging, you can go and look at it. Or if you run into a client who is like, no way, I only want to pay, you know, $20 an hour for whatever this is, you can share that information with them and say, that would be great if you were hiring a high school student, but you're hiring me and this is, this is the going rate for the type of work that I do. So uh, other than being a three-year-old, uh, <laughs> how to take control in a negotiation. And one of the most important things about taking control in the negotiation is uh, a bad pun, I, I'm warning you now. Uh, you need to get a Batman. Nope. You need to get a BATNA. A BATNA is the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. Best alternative to a negotiated agreement. Uh, negotiation nerds tend to have really awful or awkward acronyms, but we love them. And so we try to foist them on other people. But when that doesn't work, it's a backup plan. It's what you're going to do if this negotiation doesn't work out. And it's something that you figure out before you enter into the negotiation. And you do that for a couple of reasons. If you know exactly what you can do if this negotiation falls through, you are not going to stay in a bad negotiation for fear that you're never going to have another option. You'll also be in a better position to compare the offers that you're getting against this backup plan. Because you know if the offer that you've received is better than the backup plan, good. Keep negotiating. If it's worse than the backup plan, you can say, you know what, I really appreciate your time. It's been lovely talking to you, but this really isn't going to meet my needs. And you'll be amazed. They might suddenly have a lot more money available or be able to stretch their timeline or no, 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 no. Why don't we just talk about this? Walking away is very valuable, but it's not something that I would suggest that you do or threaten to do unless you know what it is you are going to do once you walk away. So having a backup plan can be very important. Um, if you are coming up with a backup plan, I recommend that they have three qualities. One, it should be something you want to do. <laughs> it should be something that you want to do because if you don't want to do it, you will not use your backup plan. And since the backup plan is the emergency hatch, it is, it is how you will escape if this negotiation goes poorly, you want to make sure that you are willing to use it. You don't want to set yourself up in a situation where um, the idea of doing the backup plan is so distressing, you're just going to keep plugging along until you can see what you can possibly get from this other person. So it should be something that you want to do. It should be something that you can do um, without getting the other person to agree. So it shouldn't be something that is dependent on somebody else doing something that you want. It, uh, so a backup plan in terms of uh, looking at freelance gigs might be um, I, might, uh, I might have been offered a job from somebody that was work that was not as interesting to me, but it's a, it's a sure thing and I've been putting off telling them no. I might say yes to that job. Uh, or a backup plan if you, um, a classic backup plan, if you were looking for a job and you currently have a job, your current job is your backup plan. You're going to go to work on Monday. Um, so it should be something that's relatively easy to do. And then finally, it should be something that supports your interests. It should get you closer to your goals. It might not be perfect, but it should help you move forward. It should not be something that either keeps you in the exact same place where you are or pushes you backwards. Because then, again, you're less inclined to use the backup plan because it is not going to be very helpful to you. So something you want to do. Yes? Yes, yeah, if you had a good high school counselor, uh, this was a safety school. 
your safety school, your backup plan, your BATNA, call it whatever you want, but uh, the, the same idea applies. Um, the other thing for taking control in a negotiation is to get rid of this phrase, yes but. Yes but doesn't work. Yes but tells somebody I want you to stop listening to me and start figuring out what you're going to say to me to prove that you are correct. That yes sounds really good, the but is the thing that tells them to stop listening to you and start paying attention to why they are right. So instead of that, just say yes and. That's all. Yes, I hear what you're saying, and here's some other information that maybe you haven't considered. Yes, that's really great, and it's not something I can do for you. Yes, I can understand why you would want that particular thing, and uh, I'm not able to do it, but here are some other ways we might be able to meet that interest. Absolutely. The, the yes and is the same idea if you've done any sort of improv, uh, which I hope you have because it is so much fun. Yes and is what they tell you to do when you are on stage. You should never walk on stage and then immediately try to create conflict with the person playing pretend with you. Um, it, it, it's not fun. But if you walk on stage and you accept and they say, man, it's really raining today, and you accept the fact that it's raining, and you say, yeah, and, you know, it, it's a horrible day to go to the circus or something else. Uh, you're playing along with their story. You're participating in their narrative. That doesn't mean you have to agree with every part of it, but it does mean that the two of you continue moving forward together. So it encourages people to listen to what you have to say. And then I want to talk about anchors and anchoring in negotiation. Um, so anchoring is this concept that when, particularly when we're talking about numbers, when we hear a number, our brain remembers that number. And then the conversation that happens after that, even if it's entirely different, will be influenced by the number that we heard. So um, uh, there, was some, uh, there was some research in uh, the 70s that totally upset the, the economic world where they proved that if you talked to somebody and had them guess about how old was um, Louis XIV when he died, they had to pick one of two numbers, or about how old was Elvis Presley when he became famous and you had to pick one of two numbers. And then you asked them how much they thought a product was worth. That guess was heavily influenced by whatever number they had guessed for the age of somebody. So totally unrelated, but still influenced. And the same thing happens in negotiation, but as you can imagine, it's much more detrimental because usually we're talking about dollars and then we're negotiating over those same dollars. So uh, the way that it might work is, let's say uh, we're negotiating over a job. Um, I have a job to offer, you're looking for a job, totally made up numbers. Um, I might say, okay, I can hire you. Uh, and the salary is uh, $70,000 with benefits. That is my anchor. I'm not going to be able to offer you less than $70,000 with benefits because you know I am willing to pay $70,000 with benefits. Now, if we change the terms, that might come up, but generally speaking, you now know I am willing to pay you at least that much money. And then let's say you say, well, that sounds really great, Katie, but uh, based on the type of position you're hiring for and the work that you need, industry average says that really we're, we're closer to 90. In, in what you're looking for. You have now anchored at $90,000. The negotiation, the number that we figure out, is gonna happen somewhere in between those two anchors. Because I know that you are now willing to accept at least $90,000. Now if I was being diabolical, I might have anchored low intentionally to get you to anchor low intentionally. Because you might have heard my $70,000 offer and said, damn, that's not even close but I guess maybe they don't have enough money, so doing a little math in my head, I'll come down by $5,000. So anchors can influence each other as well. Whoever says the first number is likely going to have the most influence. Um, but the negotiation is generally gonna happen in between these two numbers, right? And it's not gonna happen over here because you're not gonna accept less from me than you know I'm willing to pay you. And it's not gonna happen over there because I'm not going to pay you more than what you've told me you're willing to accept. Um, so one of the things that can happen when you're, when you're dealing with anchors is one, you wanna be informed. You wanna go into that negotiation understanding how money works. 
you either want to understand if uh, a classic example is if you're buying a car, you're going to pull out the Kelly Blue Book and, you know, the radio doesn't work, but the paint job's okay, the back seat's missing, it's fair. Um, and you pick the fair number for that make and model of your car. And that ends up being what influences you um, in, in determining what you think the right amount should be. So do research. Try to understand um, what the going rate is to the degree that you are able to look at other freelancers' um, bids or how they bid on projects. Do that work. If you do not feel informed, just be quiet. Just listen. Ask questions if you're going to speak rather than stating this number. But don't focus on the numbers that they toss around. Focus on getting your, your questions answered. So how are you going to use this particular product? What is the value for you in, in this? Why are you hiring for this position? What do you hope the person's going to bring to the table? Ask questions so that you can get towards their interests, away from their position, towards their interests. Um, so if you don't know what to anchor on, ask questions to get towards their interests. And then if they do anchor ridiculously low, like what, let's say the $70,000 is just offensive. I don't, I don't know how it would be, but let's say it's offensive. Um, what you need to do is you need to, uh, you need to re-anchor. You need to adjust my understanding. And the way that you are going to do that is say, you know what, Katie, uh, that's really interesting, but I've been doing a lot of research, and industry standard says that really $100,000 is the going rate for this job. I've looked at a number of different cities, and all of them show a range of between $100,000 and $120,000. Now, I understand we're in Portland, so uh, cost of living's maybe a little bit easier, but $100,000 really sounds um, like the more, a, a more fair price for this particular position. I have re-anchored, or you have re-anchored with me, by repeating that number three different times in a relatively short period of time. Because now I'm paying attention to that number. You have, you have re-established the game. Um, so if, if you find yourself in a situation where somebody has really underbid you uh, or undercut you, uh, think about re-anchoring, particularly if you know that they're completely out to lunch. Um, so the next thing is how to be awesome. I, I said at the very beginning, negotiation is a lot about confidence. And it's a lot about believing that you can have the conversation that you need to have. Conflict is scary to most people. Uh, when I did not come fully formed from law school as somebody who loved to negotiate, I in fact thought it was terrifying. Uh, because they don't actually teach you how to negotiate in law school. They teach you the law, they teach you how to argue, but they don't teach you how to negotiate. So I had to learn. And one of the things that I had to learn was in part to get over my fear. So these are a couple of different things that you can do to get over that fear. And the first one is uh, mildly embarrassing, but very easy. And that is looking at yourself in the mirror and saying, I am awesome. <laughs> I can do this. I am awesome. Your brain likes making sense of information. So even when it's information that it doesn't quite believe, just like anchoring, it hears it and it does latch on to it. Um, there, I'm, I, 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 I do not know neurobiology, but there, there, I have looked at some of the studies and there, there's evidence that mirroring neurons really do help us in this particular way. We hear something and we want to believe it, we want to do it. So I am awesome, I can do this. You can also say to yourself, uh, it's, a, it's a form of sort of being mindful, being aware and centering yourself. I am a negotiator, I negotiate. Repeat that to yourself three times. I am a neg negotiator, I negotiate. It really does help give you that little bump. And that's all you're looking for. You're looking for that bump of self-confidence in order to start the conversation. Once you get the conversation rolling, if you've done your research, if you've you know, really paid attention to what your interests are, if you've tried to figure out what their interests are, you just need to get going. You have all the information that you need to negotiate well. So um, be embarrassed in public or private. That's totally up to you. I uh, have, in fact, uh, when I worked for a, a large company and I would negotiate um, software licenses, uh, there were occasionally some companies that were really fun to negotiate with. 
And uh, I would go to the bathroom and say, I am awesome. I can do this. We're going to get X, Y, and Z, and it's going to be great. And then I would go to the meeting, and it would be fine. So um, trick your stupid brain. Help it be awesome. Our brains are really good at a lot of things, but one of the things it's not very good at is stress and, and continuing to keep going. So um, a lot of those tactics are mindfulness tactics. Taking a deep breath, doing that um, 10 times, honestly, not quickly, don't hyperventilate, but taking a nice, deep, slow breath can help calm you down. It reduces um, your stress response. Um, if, if you're really um, having a hard time, uh, one of the things you can do is sit in your chair, put your legs out in front of you, and your hands behind your head. This is not a pose that you put yourself in if you are feeling worried or scared. This is a confidence pose. And there are studies that show that by doing this for a period of as little as five minutes, you can boost your confidence. Uh, they've also done ones where people stand in the middle of the room with their hands on their hips. And then they go and do something. <laughs> <laughs> and they find, and they find that the, the, the people that are asked to do whatever the task is, they actually have a lot more self-confidence. They're, they're, they're more willing to do it, even if it is a scary thing or an un unnatural thing for them. So uh, help yourself out and trick your stupid brain. Um, the other thing is that Lady Gaga and Beyonce totally want to help you out. Uh, they're super cool about this. Um, make yourself a playlist. Make yourself a playlist of songs that make you feel good, that get your energy up, that um, you want to dance to or you want to move to, things that make you happy. It doesn't have to be a long playlist. It can, as I have had in the past, just be the same song over and over and over again. Um, but the point is that you listen to that before that meeting that's intimidating you, before you have that phone call that's intimidating you, if you're having trouble writing a particular email um, or, or message back to somebody, listening to that song while you do it can help boost your self-confidence and, and make you feel better about what it is that you're doing. <laughs> and then uh, the other thing is uh, I've been watching uh, a lot of Band of Brothers recently because of the because I'm, I'm a nerd, uh, really, is, <laughs> is why. So we, we few, we happy few, we band of brothers and sisters. Uh, there is evidence to show that people who don't negotiate very well on their own for their own interests do much better when they are told they are negotiating for somebody else. Um, there's a lot of evidence, they study this in female lawyers. We tend to do better when we have a client uh, because we feel protective of that client. So if you are somebody who is naturally nurturing, um, and it doesn't matter what your gender is, but if you are somebody who is naturally nurturing and feels better when you are representing somebody else's interests, say to yourself before you go into the negotiation, dedicate that negotiation to somebody else. This is for my husband, this is for my wife, this is for my boyfriend, this is for my dog or my cat. But pick somebody who that negotiation is for and remember that as you are negotiating. Because what you will find is you don't want to disappoint whomever that person is. And you are much more inclined to stay in the negotiation if things get a little bit sticky. Um, this is particularly helpful if you are negotiating money for uh, your livelihood. Because chances are somebody is depending on you for that money. And if you are only thinking about yourself during that negotiation, it's really easy to get sort of shoved back on your heels if uh, a surprising number comes back out that you didn't want to hear. And then finally, you should cheat. Um, <laughs> cheating is good. Cheating is great. And I don't mean real cheating. I don't, I don't mean that you're taking advantage of somebody un, in particular. I mean that you are giving yourself notes and helpful information as you are having the conversation. So um, do your research. Take notes. Write out what your backup plan is, really big and bold on the top of that sheet, and have it with you when you're on the phone or when you're going to meet with the other person, um, or as you are crafting the email that you are writing. But it is totally OK to have information there to help you out. We all get flustered. Uh, very few people are naturally really good at just like barreling through a confrontational conversation. But a lot of us do well when we have the time to reflect. So help yourself out by writing out those notes beforehand. Um, we were talking about, for some people, just the act of writing helps you remember things a lot better. Um, it, it sinks in in a different way, that, that, the physicality of actually writing. 
Um, but do give yourself that boost. Give yourself that information that you know you're going to need. And don't be afraid of being quiet. Being quiet is totally fine. Somebody asking you a question does not get to demand when you answer it. If you do not know the answer, it is perfectly OK to say, you know, I don't know. Let me think about that and get back to you. A lot of people feel that when you get in an, into a negotiation, you have to have all of the answers right away. And that's not necessarily true. So if you get stuck, you don't know what to say, rather than agreeing to somebody that, something that you might regret later on, just say, you know, I don't know. I'm going to have to think about that and get back to you later. Um, so that is my presentation. Uh, we have about 10 minutes for questions, and I'd be happy to answer any that you have. Yes? What about negotiating for things like health benefits, mm -hmm. um, which are like, either you have them or you don't in a way? Like, it's not like, like you're not even negotiating for better or worse health benefits, you're just negotiating that you want them. You want, you want health benefits. Yeah. Also, um, usually you want health benefits for a reason, right? Yeah. I mean, it, costs, it costs less to go to the doctor. Yeah. It's easier to go to the doctor because you have health insurance, and so you don't have to pay for it all yourself. So saying, you know what, uh, I need health, health benefits with this particular job, and they say, that's really great, but we don't offer health benefits to anybody, then that makes the salary number different. Because that salary number is no longer representing the fact that benefits are included. So you have these additional costs. This is, you know, this is something that you need. It will keep you happy and healthy and at work more often. Um, so, okay, I understand you're not offering benefits to anybody. I've gone out onto the health exchange and um, plugged in the numbers, and to provide health insurance just for me is going to cost me about uh, $250 a month, uh, or whatever it is. Uh, so we can adjust the salary. You're not even asking. We can adjust the salary to accommodate that additional expense. I'm okay with that. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> You're the ones the least likely to maybe re anchor that number higher. Right. Um, so the, the statement was that it, listening to the keynote yesterday about imposter s syndrome, if somebody is suffering from that um, and they're in a negotiation, they can feel kind of screwed. Um, and it's true, a lot of people feel kind of screwed when they are in, in the midst of a negotiation. If you know somebody uh, who has imposter syndrome um, and you know that they are negotiating, providing them with support, reminding them, saying, hey, do you want to sit down and talk through that conversation a couple of times? Um, practicing a negotiation is a great idea. If you have a friend who is willing to, to do that kind of role playing with you, do it. Um, I, have, I have done that with clients where we just practice how they are asking for a particular raise. And one of the, the benefits of that practice is that you've already done it. By the time you get to the actual conversation, you've done it a couple of times. So you have the confidence of knowing that you can get through it. And if, if nothing else, you can get through the conversation without dying, um, which is usually what a lot of people are worried about. I'm going to totally lose it. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, if, and a lot of people do have imposter syndrome about negotiation in particular because they think they don't do it very often. But anybody who has friends or children or a family or interacts with other human beings negotiates on a regular basis. Kids negotiate all the time. So if you have ever been around a child, you've negotiated. Um, if you have ever been, I don't know, at a conference and decided to, I don't know, go out to dinner with a group of people and had to decide on where you are going, that is a negotiation. If you've ever uh, you know, worked with your partner to figure out who's going to do the dishes, that is a negotiation. So one of the things is reminding yourself that you actually do this on a fairly regular basis, and you're good at it. Yeah? Um, you mentioned How do you know? How can you tell? What are some of the signs that negotiations are not going well? 
So the question is, what are, what are some of the signs that a negotiation is not going well? Um, I enter every negotiation assuming that it could go poorly. It might not work out. Some people might think, that, think of that as a bit pessimistic, but what it encourages me to do is think of the backup plan. What do I really want? What are, what are some ways that I could satisfy this need on my own if I had to? Um, but ways that you could tell it's not going well. If they are not being responsive to your direct questions, so if you are asking for information and they're just not providing it, um, if they keep changing, we're going to do this. No, we're going to do that. No, we're going to do this. Um, particularly if they keep changing uh, in an emotional way, like they're conciliatory and then all of a sudden they're demanding and they go back and forth. That is a negotiation that's totally worth walking away from because that person's never going to be happy. Um, but paying attention to how the other person is interacting with you. And the other thing is, if you're noticing something weird, uh, rather than assuming you know why they're being weird, say, hey, I've noticed that you haven't been able to get back to me in the last couple of times. Um, I was hoping that we could finish this, n this negotiation by the end of the week. Um, is there anything going on that I need to know about? Is there, any, you know, is there anything be behind the scenes that um, is impacting our ability to negotiate? Yes. So the question was, do you have any tips, tips about negotiating a uh, relocation? So working for the same company, but maybe in a different space. Um, a lot of it is going back to those interests and figuring out why it is that you want what you want. And then doing research to determine whether or not the company has done that in the past. Um, what, are, what are the resources that would be available for you in that new place or that new setup? Like, let's say you're working from home. What are the ways in which this is going to be beneficial for them? and you. Thinking about somebody else's interests in a negotiation uh, can be very helpful because when, w when we engage in negotiations, often what we're worried about is that the, what the other person is asking of us is taking something away. We worry that we have to give something up in order to work with this other person. If you can help them see how working with you on this particular thing is still going to be able to address their interests, they're much more likely to listen and to consider it as an option. And again, it kind of goes back to the you know, negotiating over the French Bulldog. If you just say, I want to relocate, well, yes or no. But if you say, um, I, have these, I have these different things going on in my life, uh, it would be much easier for me if I were able to work from this other location. Um, I also have identified these particular resources that would be available for me. Um, what are some different things that we could talk about to, to make that happen. Yes? Uh, you mentioned a backup plan pretty pretty explicitly. Um, and I'm, I'm just sort of getting into tech. I've, I've just finished up a boot camp and that kind of thing, and I'm looking for my first tech job. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I mean, I realized that, that you know, a backup plan going into a, a you know, hiring negotiation could, could, could be up to and including, like, you know, not working you right. know, at all or, like, you know, but, but, that, that's sort of a, a strange situation to try and have a backup plan in, you know, as compared to, fine, I'll just keep, you know, working where I'm working or right. something like that. Right. Um, about that for a minute. <laughs> the, the question is about what happens when you're actually you're looking for a job, but maybe you don't have one yet, or you are looking to move into a, a, a new industry, but you don't have a lot of experience there. Um, it's harder to have a backup plan in that situation because you're not just going to go to work on Monday. Um, one of the things that you can do is think, all right, uh, how much longer can you keep doing what you're doing? So understanding what your current status is as a backup plan. Are you at the end of your rope and you need money now? Well, in that case, it's perfectly fine to take a, an interim job, you know, a not forever job, a you satisfy my needs right now job. Um, uh, and, and that job could be a lot of different things. Um, but really sitting down and paying attention to your interests. Um, what do you want? What do you need? What's most important to you? Um, you can come up with maybe not a perfect backup plan, but a better idea of what it is you can say yes and no to. Yes, and then yes. Uh, so my, my question is, how might negotiation change based on uh, some negotiations might not take place either over the phone or face-to-face, -face, but rather email, yes. like a sweet message to colleagues or Yeah. So how do you change your negotiation task, tactic based on the medium that you're using, like face-to-face uh, -face or voice versus uh, text? 
text negotiations are perfect for numbers. They're perfect for things that don't have emotion tied to them, where you are setting out facts or you are agreeing to what the situation is. So it can be a really good way of establishing what it is you are going to talk about in, in a conversation. This is, this is the floor. Um, text negotiations are not very good for things where there is emotion because you cannot hear the other person, um, you can't see them. Often, sometimes you don't have the ability to be able to do that, but to the extent that you do, I highly encourage it. Um, it is a lot different to be sitting down from somebody or on the phone and hear them be silent and know that they are thinking about something versus, oh my God, they haven't emailed me back in two days and that probably means they hate me and everything is shit. <laughs> Sorry, there was one more. You are kind of okay. How do you avoid expressing the things you want to avoid? I don't know. Uh, I do know what you're saying. Like, you don't want to like get to the table. I'm assuming that there's a negotiation table. There usually isn't. But you don't want to get to the table and just like throw up everything, right? You don't want to like share everything. So one of the things that can be really helpful is um, that practicing with somebody else, so that you have you have the memory of I have done this, and you are able to screw up in those practice sessions. Uh, is how I think of it, rather than having to do that one-on-one -on -one with the person. Um, but you can also have, if you're taking notes in with you, you can have a list of things like, don't talk about, and just keep looking at it. So uh, that is time. Uh, I apologize for not being able to take any more questions. Thank you for coming out and talking negotiation with me on this lovely afternoon. I know you had many choices. So thanks.